Welcome, audience, to an episode of the tr- another episode of the True Crime Archives in new format. And I'm your host, CJ Data. With Pitt right here. Yep. Man, it's been a long time, Mr. McAfee. How have you uh-huh. been? Has, yeah. <laughs> All right. So today, I know I had something else planned. I. But I decided I wanted to do two before I do that specific three-parter because it's pr- pretty timely for us to talk about about this person. So, John Hankley Jr. Ah, uh, yes, this guy. Some, I think a, a president, American president, attempted a per- person who attempted to assassinate a president that I don't think gets talked about a lot. Yeah, but it's true. He doesn't really. The one that gets talked about the most is John White's booth. And Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. And thinking about it, and thinking about it, who who was that Manson family woman that tried to kill Gerald Ford? I don't remember. Anyway, I don't remember but, but we're either. not gonna talk about that person today. Here we're gonna talk about John Hinckley Jr. All right. Source up. Let's Let's just let's go with all right, let's start let's start early life. So John Hinckley was born born on May 29th, 1955. His full name is John War- Warnock Hinckley Jr. And he was born in Admore, Oklahoma. To his, to his wealthy family, a John Warnock Hinckley Sr. and and his mother Joanne Hinckley. While he was born in Oklahoma, he eventually moved to Dallas, Texas. He grew up in University Park. And attended Highland Park High School in Dallas County. He graduated in 1974. He then moved moved to Evergreen, Colorado, where the Hinkley, where his family's oil company, Hink. Hinkley Oil Company had just opened new headquarters. And is that company even still around? I am not sure. And he and he attended off and on at Texas Tech University from from the years 1974 to 1980, but eventually dropped out. Yeah. Then he like want to become a musician at some point. Yes, indeed he did. So in 1975, he relocated to Los Angeles in hope of becoming a songwriter, although efforts were not were not in his favor. And he would continue to 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 tell his parents, whether through phone call or letters, letters of his tales of misfortune, and and beg for them to to keep sending him money while while he while he most of the time fa- failed and just sat in in a ramshackle apartment eating fast food. Well, he he would also lie about having a girlfriend. Yes, yes, indeed, Lynn Collins. And uh, he also ended up attempting to move with his parents in this town of Evergreen. And and in the late nineteen seventies. He's he became infatuated with the 
movie Taxi Driver, in fact, sitting through a theater multiple times to see it. Pretty sure with him being fascinated with Robert De Niro's ca character, Tra Travis Bickle, he began purchasing weapons and practicing with them. Now and he and he also and he w did go, go to before Reagan. He did actually go to a Jimmy Carter rally with the intent to to try to kill him, but he didn't go through with that. That uh, and and on his way back home, he was in his luggage. It, it was it they found a firearm he forgot to check. He was let go with a slap on the wrist fine. Fine. Although he, his when John Hinckley's parents then, then got word of it, it, they took him to a, to a psychiatrist, which, which he then was prescribed antidepressants and, and tranquilizers to deal with his emotional problems. But that clearly didn't work out in his case. Because the guy was still crazy. All right. Now we're going to get to the point that we're all that we're, that we're all waiting for. And or and that was and that is his obsession with with Jody Foster. The thing that pretty much pretty much started this whole thing. And so or should I say inspired this whole thing driving into into madness. So, so John Hinckley Jr. became obsessed with the actress, young actress Jodie Foster, after her seeing her performance as Iris at, in Taxi Driver. Who is a trafficked minor, minor in the film. Then he eventually said, that Robert De Niro eventually rescues. Sometime in the 80s when Jody enrolled and began attending Yale University, Hinckley then moved to New Haven, Connecticut for a sh short time to stalk her. He sent love letters and romantic poems and repeatedly called and left her messages on her telephone. So he figured the only way to truly get her attention was to do something big. And he fantasized about things for from aircraft hijacking to killing himself in front of her to get her attention. This dude was desperate, jeez. Yeah. It's like, I'm so madly in love, I'm gonna go commit a terrorist activity. So he... So, after... So, despite him getting treatment for his depression and emotional issues, his mental health did not improve. And eventually, seeing no other way, he then tried again, again to try to target a president, and that was Ronald Reagan in 1981. For And for the purpose, he collected material on the assassination of J John F. Kennedy. Which that one's a story in and of itself. I don't think we're going to cover him anytime soon, but. Mm -hmm. 
So he wrote, so on the day he was planning to kill Reagan, he wrote to Foster just before his attempt. Attempt, and it read, over the past seven months, I've left you dozens of poems, letters, and love messages in in fa the faint hope that you can develop an interest in me. Although we talked on the phone a couple of times, I never had the nerve to simply approach you and introduce myself. The reason I'm going ahead with this attempt now is because I can't wait any longer to impress you. John Hinckley Jr. So, well, I'm trying, I'm still trying, it's kind of weird though how he thought about doing something like killing himself or assassinating a president would it get him a girl. It's, show, it's like he thought he would do that and show like, oh, wow, this guy is such a dream. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now the point we're all we've all been waiting for. And that is the day of the assassination. You want you want to cover this part? Yeah. Sure. All right, so uh, on March 30th around at 1981 around 2:30 p.m. Uh, he shot a 22 caliber Rob RG-14 revolver six times at Reagan as he left the Hilton Hotel. After the president what, addressed an AFL-CIO conference, uh, he ended up wounding a police officer named Thomas Delante. And a service and a secret service agent, Timothy McCarthy, and the and press secretary James Brady, was, Brady, Brady was pretty. And he injured. has a a legacy of his own, but it's not important here. But uh, he didn't hit Reagan directly, but apparently he was seriously wounded when a bullet ricocheted off of his limousine and hit him in the chest. And that's one part I didn't know before before he before I started researching this. So a guy uh a guy named Alfred Antenucci but was a Cleveland, Ohio labor official who Ended up hitting Hinkley up ahead and pulled him to the ground. So, um. Within two seconds, Dennis McCarthy, no relation to Agent Timothy McCarthy, dove onto Hinkley, intent on prote protecting Hinkley, and, and to avoid what happened to Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, yeah. This thing? Who was killed before he could be tried for the pre for the assassination of President Kennedy? Yeah, he was killed before that. Yeah, he was killed by Jack Ruby, and there's a whole thing about that. But anyway, another Cleveland labor official, Frank McNamara, joined Antonucci and started punching Hinckley in the head, striking him so hard he drew blood. Brady had been shot by Hinckley in the right side of the head and endured a long recuperation period, remaining paralyzed on the left side of his body. Until his death on August 4, 2014. Brady's death was ruled a homicide 33 years after the shooting. Huh. <laughs> Not sure how, how I feel about that, but let's move. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, that is kind of odd. I mean, he was paralyzed because of a bullet, but it didn't exactly kill him. So, how is that a homicide? <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Uh, he was tried has... in 1982 to in, in Washington, D.C., charged with 13 offenses. He was found 
he, he pleaded and was found not guilty by reason of insanity on June 21st. The defense psychiatric reports portrayed Hinckley as insane, while the prosecution reports, reports characterized, characterized him as legally sane. Hinckley was transferred into psychiatric care from Bureau of Prisons custody on August 18th, 19th. 19, 18th. And soon after his trial, Hinckley wrote, wrote the shooting was the greatest love offering in the history of the world and was disappointed and that Foster did not reciprocate his love. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, this, this dude definitely had a, had a really unhealthy obsession. <laughs> and and needless to say, the the verdict was not received well by anybody. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so much so that states such as Idaho, Montana, and Utah, my home state, abolished the defense altogether. Don't know, don't know if that changed in recent years, but then whatever. In the United States, before Hink. In a Hinkley case, the insanity defense had been used less in less than two percent of all felony cases, and was unsuccessful in almost seventy-five percent of those trials. Public outcry over the verdict led to the Insanity Defense Reform Act in nineteen eighty-four, which altered the rules for consideration of mental illness of defendants in federal criminal court proce proceedings. 1985, Hinkley parent, Hinkley's parents wrote Breaking Points, a book detailing their son's mental condition. And before we go, now this was this is only a rumor. I I can't confirm, but I think it should get out there. Correct me if I'm wrong wrong in the audience but apparently it it didn't go over well to to a point where a local found out where he was being housed and and tried to go in and kill john although that did not go over well at all and that guy ended up getting a getting arrested himself when the gun fell out of his pants huh so and wasn't he like released in 2016? We're gonna get to that. All right, so now let's get to treatment here. Hinckley was confined at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. After Hinckley was admitted, tests found that he was an unpredictably dangerous man who might harm himself or any third party. In 1983, he told Penthouse that on a normal day, he would see a therapist, answer mail, play guitar, listen to music, play pool, watch television, eat lousy food... And take delicious medication. I medicine that medication must have tasted real good. Or it just made him feel a certain way. It's probably more likely. Probably. Around nineteen eighty seven, Hinckley applied for a court order allowing him periodic visits home. As part of the consideration of the request, the judge ordered Hinckley's hospital room searched. Hospital officials found photographs and letters in Hinckley's room that showed he, a continued obsession with Jodie Foster, as well as the evidence that Hinckley had exchanged letters with serial killer Ted Bundy, who was who was on death row at this point, and sought the address of the incarcerated Charles Manson. Why? He... 
who had inspired inspired Lynette Frome to try to kill United States President Gerald Ford. There's that person I talked about earlier. The court denied his initial request for additional privileges. In 1999, though, he was permitted to leave the hospital for supervised visits with his parents. In April 2000, the hospital recommended allowing unsupervised release, but rescinded the recommendation a month later. Hinckley was allowed supervised visits with his parents again during 2004 and 2005. Court hearings were held in September 2005 on whether he could have expanded privileges to leave the hospital or not. On December 30th, 2005, the judge ruled Hinckley would be allowed visits supervised by his parents in their home in Williamsburg, Virginia. The judge ruled Hinckley could have up to three visits of three nights and then four visits on of four nights, each depending on the successful completion of the last. All the experts who testified at Hinckley's 2005 conditional release hearing included government experts agreeing that his depression and, and psychotic disorder were in full remission and that he should have some expanded conditions of release. Hinckley requested further freedoms, including one and two one-week visits with his parents and a month-long visit. U.S. Di District Judge Paul L. Friedman, or Friedman, de denied that request on June 6, 2007. On June 17, 2009, Judge Friedman ruled that Hinckley would be permitted to visit his mother for a dozen visits of 10 days at a time, rather than six, to spend more time outside the hospital and to have a driver's license. The court ordered that Hinckley would be required to carry a GPS-enabled cell phone to track him whenever he was outside of his parents' home. He was prohibited from speaking with the news media. The prosecutors objected to this ruling, saying that Hinckley was still a danger to others and had, an, and had unhealthy and inappropriate thoughts about women. Hinckley recorded a song, Ballad of an Outlaw, which prosecutors, which the prosecutors claim is reflecting suicide and lawlessness. Technically, it's freedom of speech. In March 2011, it was reported that a forensic psychologist at the hospital testified that Hinckley had recovered to the point that he posed no imminent risk of danger to himself or others. On, two on March 29, 2011, the day before the 30th anniversary of the assassination attempt, Hinckley's attorney fire filed for a for while the court petition requesting more freedom for his clients, including additional unsupervised visits to the home of Virginia home of 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 Hinckley's mother, Joanne. On November thirtieth, two thousand eleven, a hearing in Washington was held to consider whether he could have lived full time outside the hospital. The Justice Department opposed this, understandably so, stating that Hinckley still poses a danger to the public. Justice Department argued that Hinckley had already been known to deceive his doctors in the past. By December 2013, the court ordered that he be extended to his mother, visits to be extended to his mother, who lives near Williamsburg. Hinckley was permitted up to 
to eight seven day seventeen day visits with evaluation after the completion of each one. On August 4, 2014, James Brady died as Hinckley had critically wounded him back in 1981. The death was ruled a homicide. Hinckley did not face charges as a result, though, because it had been because he had already been found not guilty of the original crime by reason of insanity. In addition, Bra since Brady's death occurred more than than 33 years after the shooting, exactly. Prosecution of Hinckley was barred under the year-and-a-day law in effect in the District of Columbia at the time of the shooting. Which basically states that any cr you, people can't be charged to crimes like murder that happens like a year and a day after the incident. All right, so so now we're gonna get to the point because this is one of the one of the people we've done on the show that's still alive to this day. Yeah, you want to talk about his release? Yeah, he happened to actually be released not too long ago on July seventh, twenty seventh, two thousand sixteen. Oh well, okay, that's when the judge said he could be released. He was okay. actually released on August 5 of that year. And, uh, he officially moved to what is released to psychiatric care on September 10th, 2016. But he had to live with his mom full time in Williamsburg, Virginia. And uh, he also did have prohibitions put on him, such as drinking alcohol, possession of any firearm, or ammunition, or other weapons, uh, memorabilia of Jody Foster, uh, contacting Reagan's family, Brady's family, Jody Foster, or her family, or agent, watching or listening to violent movies, television, or compact disc. Uh, accessing printed or online porn, access to violent movies, television, music, novels, and magazines, speaking to the press, visiting present or past homes of any government official or president, visiting graves of past presidents or government officials, driving from his mother's home more than 30 miles unattended or 50 miles when attended, and erasing his computer's web browser history. I don't know, that's a that's a bit of a list of prohibitions. Right, and also required. He not, yeah, to, he he was required to work at least uh three days a week to leave immediately if he finds himself approaching prohibited places, and to also record his browser history. So does that mean he had to like write it down or something? Or maybe just have it, you know, the history kept. So as as we're as we're almost out of time, let's just let's just do this last part. Although the court ordered a risk assessment to be completed with 18 months of his release. It has not been done as of May 2018. On November 16, 2018, Judge Freeman ruled Hinckley Hink could move out of his mother's house in Virginia and live on his own upon location approval from his doctors. On September 10, 2019, Hinckley's attorney stated that he had planned to ask for a full unconditional release from the court that determined he could live by how he could live by the end of the that year. On September 27, 2001, federal judge approved John Hinckley for unconditional release beginning June 2022. On June 15, 2022, he was fully released without court 
from court restrictions. Yeah. And uh, it said that he actually had a uh, currently had he actually has a YouTube channel apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he creates covers of music, and his subscribers by December twenty twenty one was about twenty four thousand five hundred. Man. Man, and he definitely doesn't look like he did back in the 80s, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, I've seen pictures of him recently. He's definitely, of course, a lot older. And heavier than he probably was. But anyway, now the thing is, will he remain free or will he screw up again? Who knows? Because you never can tell. Yeah, you never can. So far, it seems like he's learned his lesson after all those years. Now, all right. Well, everybody, that's that's that was the story of John Hinckley Jr. Hope you all enjoyed this, and hope you're gonna enjoy our new format. Like, subscribe, favorite, and I'll see y'all. We'll see y'all in the next one. Hi, everyone. Whoa!